Time for Sex, the podcast. Cause sexuality is tough. And okay, sex just isn't good enough. No, time for, time for sex. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Sex, the podcast. Erica Miley here. I just wanted to do a quick introduction of the next interview I have coming. This is Dr. Nazanin Mowali. She has her private practice in LA. It's called Oasis to Care. She'll talk a little bit further in the episode, so stay tuned to, through to the end to see her content, to get her contact information, all of that. But we talk about sex and shame. We also talk a lot about the erotic blueprint and what on earth that is, as well as how does it apply to you and what might it mean for your sexual life. So I can't wait to share this with you now for Dr. Nazanin Moali. All right, here we are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sex Podcast. I have a guest today, Dr. Nazanin Moali. I said it right. right yeah, now. yeah, you got it. Perfect. <laughs> Very awesome. Um, so uh, Naz and I met each other through um, a, a group, a podcasting group. Um, uh, doctor, he, he's doctor, yeah, right? Melvin's yeah. doctor. Yeah. Dr. Melvin, and I can never say his last name right. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Gaze, I think, or for Gaze. Um, But that's how we met, and we started kind of chatting with each other through Skype, and um, I, I, I'm I, not going to speak for Naz, but I have a professional crush on her. Aww, so, me um, too. It's Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted her to come on and talk to you guys today about uh, an erotic blueprint. So she's going to talk first a little bit about how she became interested in uh, sex therapy and sexology. Um, Naz, where did you start? How did you get here? So uh, it's an interesting story. So I grew up in Iran and in my culture, like, you know, we don't talk about sex at all. And then so like growing up, I didn't have much information about sexuality. It was when well, it was something I was very interested in, like learning more about it. And, you know, one one interesting thing that happened in personal, my personal life was I was with this partner and we had sexual challenges. And I was going from one therapist to another therapist. These are like were very competent therapists that could they could like treat everything. But somehow they were kind of clueless about sex therapy and human sexuality. And they were giving me this information. It wasn't working. It was just so frustrating. So what happened, I started reading about these things and kind of like seeing a sex therapist and within a few sessions, the issue got resolved. I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Yeah, that there are so many therapists out there that are competent. They don't necessarily know about this wonderful evidence base, ways that you can address the sexual challenges. And it really impacts your self-esteem when there's an issue around sexuality. And it was just like, just opened my eyes to this wonderful field of sexuality and sex therapy. And that's how I got interested in it. That's fantastic. I, I think, and I think many of us who work in this field have maybe a similar story that we just, there either we ran into an issue ourselves or we look at the field and we go, why, why aren't we talking more about this? Why, why is there such shame wrapped around it? And why, and not only that, like these are, we have met so many competent other professionals in our field, right? Mm -hmm. Like so many. And I, I've definitely found that in my work as well, that yeah, I have met some incredibly smart and talented therapists, but there just seems to be this, this, unless you study sex mm -hmm. therapy or, and you study sexology and sex education, that there's just, there's just something missing. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad that it walked that path for you. <laughs> now we get your wonderful word. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about what an erotic bl blueprint is. So erotic blueprints is a combination of thoughts, emotions, fantasies, and uh, like different things that kind of help you to feel aroused. So it puts you in this peak sexual experiences. And mm -hmm. what's interesting about erotic blueprint is just it helps people to have this awesome 
sexual relationship with themselves and others and also it gives them information about their internal psyche and their uh, psychological uh, like blueprint as well and it's just it's it's very unique in a way that I kind of think about it as uh, fingerprints every person has one uh, kind of a specific uh, fingerprints uh, like special for them it's not like your fingerprint is better than mine it's just different so you know sometimes people are like it's like when they, we hear about this that uh, sometimes they say like so and so is a great kisser or he's a bad kisser but it's just it's their erotic your erotic blueprint might not be a match for them so it's about how we like to get touched how what kind of partner we want what kind of a fantasy turns us on what kind how frequent we want sex and all these wonderful things are part of our blueprint our sexual blueprints yeah i mean it sounds kind of like you're describing almost like data collection for yourself about your own sexual life absolutely yeah and it's like any other uh kind of data collection the more data you have the more curious you you, you are about this the better understanding you have around your uh, erotica and what turns you on do you feel like curiosity and taking the standpoint of curiosity is helpful to to your clients especially when it comes to their sex life absolutely because what i hear and i'm sure at times you notice that is in our society uh we don't talk about sex as much so people have this kind of narrow idea of what is a healthy sexuality and when they're not necessarily feeling that a narrow image they feel shame and they want to suppress that part of their personality and it's just like gets kind of very complicated and plays out in different areas of their life but if we have we're coming from this place of curiosity we're like looking like an anthropologist studying a tribe we're not judging this uh, kind of behavior. We're learning about what does this do for me? What else can I add to this or modify or intensify it? Yeah. What does this behavior mean? What is what what purpose does this behavior have for me? Right. I think that's an excellent way to think about it. And there's I, I mean, there's tons of research to support what you're talking about, even in Aside from sexuality, being able to deal with shame generally and learning to be able to step back from your thoughts and your feelings and go, okay, can I observe this? Can I be a Columbo for myself? Right. And learn to let thoughts pass and learning to like pay attention to your own physical cues. I think that's a fantastic way to think about it. So how, where, if, if, if I was... If I was brand new to this and I'm sitting with you in your office and I go, I've never heard of this before. How, where do I start? How, how would, how would a client or anybody out there in the world, how would they begin to be figure out their own erotic blueprint? Excellent question. So I, I often, the way I explore it in my clients is kind of think about the three peak sexual experiences you had. It could be with yourself when you're masturbating, could be with a partner, uh, could be a number of different things. And kind of like honing and kind of thinking back on those moments. What was the emotion that was present? And it's not necessarily like, you know, when people think about sexuality, sometimes they think about excitement, joy. Those are valid emotions. But like what sometimes we consider negative emotion can be part of our uh, erotic blueprint, like shame, anxiety, yeah. guilt. So what was that emotion in the room? What was what were you feeling? What was the images that was going around and what were you thinking? And also with your partner, who was your partner or partners? What was the dynamic of the relationship or like what was the like sometimes, you know, power is part of that. But be really curious about it versus kind of judging yourself. I, sometimes like a side note, I have clients that the great sexual interaction that they had was through their hookup experience and they kind of feel shameful and don't want to think about it but just be really curious and I would kind of create two different categories one like for masturbation and fantasies around masturbation and one with the partner and kind of see extract those situation and see what was the emotion thoughts feelings and uh what was the common theme in those experiences 
That's excellent. I think that's such a wonderful way to kind of step back, kind of like what we talked about just a minute ago, being able to step back and being curious. And I think I, I was just thinking about like what you said about intensity and negative, if there could be negative emotions present and maybe, maybe we've never considered that before that those peak sexual experiences might have complex emotion, not just joy or excitement or positive feelings that we, we as people are, I, I tell my clients all the time, we're gray and squishy, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're not just, we're not just positive or negative emotions. There's, there's complex emotions and they come and they go and they are often interacting with each other at the same time. Exactly. It is it's completely possible to have that joy, excitement, and a negative emotion out like fear at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really cool way to think about it. As that's just awesome. Um, so when you think about what your what your clients, when you think about the things that they typically come in, some of their biggest concerns or the most common concerns that you see, what do you see? So I see a number of different kind of things related to erotic blueprint. One thing is that uh, they're coming in, I have a number of like very successful driven women and they feel kind of shame, perplexed because of the fantasies that they have. They kind of feel, oh, I don't know, I'm this feminist, I don't know why I like, like uh, BDSM or I like spanking and help me understand that. And they at times come to change those behaviors. But what I realize is uh, it's more about understanding it. What does it do for you? And kind of coming out of this place of shame and as we were talking about into this place of curiosity and understanding your psychological dynamic. The other category I see are couples. They're coming in because most often couples, they don't communicate clearly about their sexual needs and fantasies. So then at times one partner goes out of the marriage and then they kind of like the other partner realize that there was this other aspect of the partner's sexuality that wasn't disclosed. So now it because of the, their sense of betrayal, but also confusion. And I think I that's a challenging one to unpack because now there's a sense of betrayal. And it's just like the partner, at times when I see it, what's in roots of it is that the partner was feeling shameful about their, uh, about his or her uh, erotic needs or sexual behaviors. So for example, I had someone a few years ago that he was into pegging and he didn't want that, do like introduce that to his partner and talk about it with his wife. And then that got confusing when then like the, uh, the person that he was involved with disclosed that to the wife and it was just like this mess. And I think it was just like the, at root of it, it was that the partner, the husband didn't want to, didn't feel comfortable. It was shameful. He didn't want to disclose that to um, his wife. So there's a number of reasons that, you know, uh, it's important for us to kind of think about it, be aware of our erotic blueprint and also uh, share our sexual needs with our partners. Right. That I feel like that negotiation, it, it is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have that same experience when couples come in to see me, they will often come in and say, well, there, we had, we didn't talk about this thing. And then it is wrapped in that betrayal and fear, like you were talking about. And it, it's this renegotiation that needs to take place. And then there's some sometimes some shame wrapped around it, right? Right. And I think part of it also is not having good communication skill. So I can disclose something about my experience is, you know, I, I took this sexual assessment class for part of the sex therapy training. And they were showing us different kinds of erotic movies and porns. The idea is like a therapist needs to be familiar with different genres of erotica and erotic images and porn and kind of see where, where she or he is. So I was sharing that with my husband. One of the, I was just like telling him the list of the things we saw and some of them were like really out there. And then I kind of like put in something I, I, I felt it was I was curious about. 
And he was in the mode that is still I'm making kind of like, you know, saying how things are outrageous. So I was feeling this, this discomfort. So I wasn't clear about, oh, like, I didn't say I want to try this. I said, oh, these were the things that like among like kind of range of things we saw. And that wasn't a um, good way of communicating what I want. So I think it's just really important to, as you talk about, like, you know, be open to negotiate things and also be very clear about what you want and own it. And, and I think it's that example, the example you just gave that I think we, I think every single one of us does too, (laughs) that we think with our significant other partners, we think, oh, they're going to know what I mean Mm -hmm. when I do this thing. Right. Or when I say this thing, when in reality, they don't. (laughs) Right. Which is like making fun of like, you know, like this, this thing that wasn't part of what we're doing. And then out of blue, I switched to something I I want without saying this. As you said, like, that's what I want. And I wanted him to do a mind reading that now we're in another level of communication. Mm-hmm. I, I, I will own that I have done that with my husband and, and just said, hey, I, I'm trying to get him to think of something or that I think he should think or already know when in reality, what I'm doing is expecting him to read my mind. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I've definitely heard um, both. I, I hear both females and males do this. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes this is attributed to women only. Right. That women only do this when in reality, we all do this. Every single person does this. This, this thinking error is something that we all practice regularly and will do again and again and again. Right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's just important to kind of like see the pattern and own it instead of like blaming your partner that, you know, he or she is not interested in kind of, she, she's not sexually open and curious and, not open to exploring things kind of saying that you know I wasn't clear about it so like just giving our partner enough credit right taking that ownership even if you don't own all of the thing right right taking ownership of any responsibility actually does a lot of that diffusing of conflict Mm -hmm. right so I think I'm just ah that's fantastic stuff Nash I'm just you're a rock star. Um, so when when you think about, we've kind of already been touching on this, but I think it's because we both see this so much. Like when you think about how much shame you see in your practice, you see just with friends, with you and your husband, how do you normalize shame with sex? It's very interesting because we all kind of get socialized, kind of like with I like thinking about like pairing sexuality with shame. There are not many families that they open, like they have, they provide good sex education to their children and just like a lot of shame around our body and our sexuality. And it's just like, somehow we have this expectation. We grow up, we're going to change, which is so challenging. So what I see about shame is Part of it is just not talking about it, not talking about what's going on. And it's just that sense of isolation that I'm the only one struggling. And this is, um, I like this behavior. No one else is doing this. No one else has this urge. And I'm a freak because of it. So it's just really important to talk about it and find your tribe. I think now we are in the time of internet, even at the, at uh, at communities that are not necessarily uh, sexually open, you can find lots of good forum online and find your own tribe of talking about these things to get support because shame cannot exist if we are in the presence of other people who truly care and gets us. That's I, I think that's completely right on. We... Uh, all the time, all the time, we think we are more. We perceive that we are all, are more lonely and isolated and alone in our thoughts and feelings and behaviors than we actually are. I was uh, right before our conversation. I was listening to NPR and they were talking about loneliness is an epidemic. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, and I, I feel and I think I think that's why um, Brene Brown and and things like that are so popular. Well, first and foremost, she's more than more than right. <laughs> we're, we're one afraid of vulnerability. And we are also very, very isolated, even when we have the internet and social mm-hmm. media and 
our perception of being lonely mm-hmm. is fairly significant in our culture today. We spend a lot of time numbing rather than connecting. Right. And sex is that most intimate connection, right? That we have to be our vo- most vulnerable. Right. And so we we create a lot of scripts and a lot of things that we tell ourselves around it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're right on with that. And kind of this but big part of like having this sexual ex- great sexual experience is just like being truly seen. Like being allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And it's just like, you know, if we're hiding toward like different kind of like defenses and isolating because you're feeling shameful that if people will see my true true self and true urges and needs, they're gonna reject us, then we're never gonna have this true connection with other people. And like that's a key for being true intimate with someone is expressing our vulnerable side and showing our vulnerabilities. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You're so funny. It's 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 a hard it's one of the hardest things for us to do. And but it's the thing that we need the most, right? right. Like it we want so badly to be connected to other people. It doesn't mean that everybody's an extrovert. No, it, what it does mean though, is that we need that connection, that in-person connection, even if that in-person connection is over Skype, because I get to do that with you today. <laughs> like you mean. But it, yeah, look, it, it's, we need this. And for us to be able to communicate well about our bodies and sex, we need that connection. Right. And it doesn't necessarily mean it. I don't want it to sound like, I, I mean, like, it has to be one way or it has to be monogamous or it has to be mm-hmm. any of those things. It, it it just means that we have to have this connection, even if it's like you were talking about that, um, uh, that, that person that had that hookup who was, a, that was a pretty significant sexual experience for that person. I, I, they experienced connection, right? Right. It, it's right. possible. Yeah. And truly showing up in all kind of relationship that even since the hookup casual sex being able to be vulnerable because I feel like sometimes people want to create excitement by kind of adding props into their like, sexual behavior, which is great at time. I love the sense of novelty, but again, it's just like, unless we truly try to be kind of vulnerable and be showing up as ourselves in the bedroom, it's just hard to be uh, truly intimate. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to make sure that I we chat a little bit about some of the things that, that you've read or or maybe blogs you've done because I, I read your blogs all the time. Uh-huh. Um, so what what helpful books, blogs, articles are you reading these days? Sure. So there is this wonderful book. If people are kind of curious about the uh, dynamic of their fantasies, because, you know, what I realize is at time people are going to get freaked out because of the kind of fantasies that they have. There is this wonderful book called Arousal by uh, Michael Bader and talks about what is the meaning of fantasies. And obviously our fantasies are different, but it gives you some uh, kind of a structure on being curious and kind of being understanding of like different themes that people have and around their sexual fantasies. Also, uh, I oftentimes I do blogging on psychology of food, sex, and drugs. So if you're curious, you can check out my uh, website at oasis2care.com. And um, I have a podcast on psychology of sex and pleasure. And uh, you can find it in my website. The podcast name is sexology so i would i would love it if you can check it out and let me know what you think yes check out all the things that naz is doing because she's doing awesome things thank you and i'll make sure that all of that is in the show notes so that folks can link directly to it so um is there any other way people can find you in the world so i i'm in all, almost all social media and and the handle is at oasis to care oasis to care which is the name of my private practice so we can get connected in twitter facebook wherever you are and are you taking any new clients right now yeah yeah thank you for bringing that up uh, yes i'm in la i have two private practices in hermosa beach and torrance and also i do uh video counseling with people who are in, around the globe 
Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you for joining us today, Naz. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. This was so wonderful. And that's it for this episode of Sex the Podcast. Thanks to my guest, Dr. Nazanin Moali, and thanks to all of you for listening to this podcast. I'm so stoked all of you are here. All of the information that you just heard, all of the resources will be located in the show notes. Also, I'm still taking just a few more clients. So please check out the show notes. And if you're interested in becoming one of my clients, head to ericamiley.com. I can't wait to chat with all of you. Signing off. Have a great week and don't forget to subscribe.